uh, there's always a tension like that in social movements. It's really interesting that the dynamics in social movements, but the radicals have got to be educators of their own movement and radicalize their own movement, you know, get them involved yeah. in that sense. I do agree with that, and, and I suppose I, I go back to one of the things I, I say in, in my general kind of uh, academic uh, presentation, if you like, which, which is that Tom Reagan, who wrote The Case for Animal Rights, he says that there is some line drawing to be done, but you should always draw your lines in pencil because they're going to move. And, and it is true that, you know, there's a danger, there's a danger for the moderates, if you like, to be associated with the radicals, but there's also a danger for the radicals to be moderated by them. You know, the moderate. So you, you, you've got to maintain your radicalism at the same time. It's a, it's a kind of difficult balance to have. And quite often it doesn't work, and that's why you have splits. And you know, most, most social movements, if you look at the history of them, there are a whole series of splits in them, because you have different ideological uh, views. And once you get one section thinking that the other section is actually a harm to their movement, then you've got a real problem. If, if they just think, oh, well, they're just doing something else that I, I don't think want to do, that's one thing. But if you think that the other people are doing something which is harmful, then you, then you start to oppose them. I mean, Francis Young, for example, now is effectively a counter-movement. He says he's not part of the existing movement. You know? And so he acts now as a, 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 as a counter-movement to the existing movement. You know? uh, most of the people in the existing movement still regard him as an animal advocate because of what he says and what he does, but he actually wants to destroy their movement. You know? And he also thinks that they're not capable of being part of his movement because they're welfareists. Yeah? So once you, once you get into that situation where you actually start to think that the other people are damaging your, your cause rather than just helping it in a different way or just doing stuff or even being neutral if you like, then you've got a, a big problem. And it, it, it's a real problem for most social movements. So I, I agree with you. you, you've got to, to balance. But if you lose your radicalism, that's very dangerous. Because you'll just get sucked in, because the mainstream is bigger, it's more middle class, you know, it's white, you know, it's comfortable, and you can easily get sucked into it. And uh, it's important. But it's not just the direct action side of that, it's the grassroots as well. The grassroots have also got to be, make sure that their relationship with the mainstream is a little bit kind of arm's length to me. You know, they need a bit of independence and they need to, you know, to keep questioning their relationship with them. Otherwise, again, they'll just become another arm of the mainstream, and, that's, and that, that would be disaster thing. So it would just be a mainstream moderate movement, nothing else. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I was talking about the direct action part of that, yes. But I mean, obviously... I'm curious as to what the, why you think it's... Well, again, it's, it's funny because, like, I mean, we were, we were talking earlier about, about the fact that we, we, we seem to be reaching a bit of a peak in terms of veganism, you know? We were, we were talking that, um, I mean, Ed over there, he, he went to an event in, uh, in Germany uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they've now got all vegan supermarkets over there, lots and lots of vegan restaurants in places like Berlin and everything, and so... In some senses, in fact, somebody I was talking to. Sorry, it must be trendy now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that is also a danger. That you know, because if things become trendy and people are kind of doing the right thing for the wrong reason, that's another problem. You know, there's a lot of people who do the right thing for the wrong reason. Tina talked about being vegan for health reasons. You know, I mean, you know, the the essence of veganism is a philosophy, so it's ethical. You know, it's, it's a philosophical thing about ultimately non-violence and respect and this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, going back to that, that point, there, there is seem to be now that veganism itself is moving into the mainstream, which obviously is a good thing. I, I, I call it a numbers game in the sense that there's been a lot of work on this in terms of social change, 
social change is a very complicated thing about, you know, we don't know how it works, you know, and sometimes it's just uh, luck, and you know, a few, a few kind of pieces come together and you end up with a jigsaw. Um, usually social change is quite slow, but it, in, in terms of what will precisely kind of work, you know, it's, it's kind of not really uh, known, you know. Um, but, you know, as, the, as the, the vegan movement gets larger and larger and becomes more mainstream, then that means then that the people who follow the existing vegans now will have a much easier time being a vegan. In the same way as if you look back to when I went vegan in 1979, it was kind of pretty tough, as we speak, to be a vegan compared with now. It's a piece of cake now, a piece of vegan cake now. Uh, I mean, there wasn't even any soy milk when I was vegan. You know, there was a tin of something called clam milk, which was ground, which was ground up nuts. You know? And uh, I think I, I said recently, most people that I knew in the 80s didn't like it. I actually quite, quite liked it. It was, it was like a thick thing. And what you would do is you would use it straight from the tin as cream. And if you wanted milk, you would, you would uh, mix it half and half with water. Yeah? Um, and so that was like, way before uh, soy milk. So there's been a radical difference in that sense. You know? So you can say, yes, we're moving, we're moving in terms of you know, upwards from the vegan point of view. And I think part of that is the fact that now the movement has finally accepted veganism as the moral baseline. And I think that's, a, that's been very important in, in the last recent years, where people talk about veganism in their, you know, like um, sociologists see social movements as claims makers. So our claims making now, the journalist comes along and says, why are you here? You know, we've been talking about veganism very early on, you know. In the 80s, I used to know loads of vegans, and I was a vegan myself, and yet we, we didn't talk about veganism. We would talk about hunting or bin section. And, you know, it never kind of really occurred to us to, to, to kind of put it into an overarching kind of vegan thing. In fact, it's really weird because if I were to think about what people would think about the movement in those days, you'd have groups like the League Against Crude Sports and Compassionate World Farming being thought of as part of the animal rights movement, and yet the vegan society would then get. Well, that's, the, that's the diet thing, you know. It wasn't integrated the way it is now, and I think that's a big difference. Any more for any more? Do you ever think we'll get to uh, <laughs> a world a vegan world? Yes, yes. I um, I do, I do, I do have uh, my pessimistic uh, moments, uh, but I also, I also have this concept called poverty of ambition, you know. And um, so I try and maintain optimism. And when I'm, when I'm in my pessimistic mood, I tell myself you could be wrong. So my answer to that is yes. But cautiously, obviously, we've got a lot to do, especially in Ireland. You know, we're starting off at a, a ground level. But again, even in Ireland, it's amazing. You know, in, in terms of what I was told to expect of Ireland, Ireland is far advanced of that. You know, people, you know, Irish people come along in Dublin, they know what vegan is, they know what vegan is, is about, they've got a, a rough idea of, you know, about how our views are, and they don't just fall, fall about, you know, laughing anymore. Well, at least not all of them do. Whereas, you know, it wasn't long ago when we really were the kind of cranks of society, you know. I always make the point that the 1970s vegetarian society, uh, cafes in London, were called cranks. Know, as, as a kind of ironic double take on, on the issue, now we've got the issue of vegan freaks, you know, because sociologically we are quite freaky in the sense that there's so few of us. Yeah. But in terms of the mainstream reaction to vegans now, it's a world away from what it used to be. I mean, you know, you ask all the vegans in the 1980s, they hardly knew any of the vegans apart from the ones that they campaigned with. They never heard the word vegan. You, know, you, you ask someone like John White from the Invercargill Vegan Society, he's only been going for about five years, and uh, I think, I think uh, when he started it, he'd never met, he'd never met another vegan. You know? And then now I think they've got about ten members, yeah, which, okay, is it ten members? But I mean, that's, you know, that's amazing for him, because he now sees the word vegan in, in his local newspaper, anything, and he'd never seen that ever before. So we are moving forward, even though that might sound a bit 
you know, we've still got a lot to do, but we are moving forward, that is true. Can I just bring up a point? Yes, of course. On behalf of traditional meat eaters, I understand the meat eat concept, I've been vegetarian myself for 20 years. What about if we let cows and goats and everything live? Won't they take over all everything, grazing land, everything and everything and everything? They'll just breed, 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 breed until we have no resources left to feed ourselves. I'm not quite sure if I understand the right. question. In the if we don't cull cattle, if we don't cull pigs, if we don't cull goats, if we don't cull rabbits, if we don't cull... But the question is, if we don't breed... We, 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 no, 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 let them be, leave them alone, do the vegan thing, try, try it out for, say, right, what's the span, 14 years. Let it all be, let it all be. Um, won't be, we be overrun with cattle? Say Ireland does a little island. If we leave them all alone and be totally vegan, won't... The animals just like completely take over and be starving to death themselves because there isn't enough land to feed them, there isn't enough this and that and the other and everything. And Ireland turned out to be an animal third world country because there isn't enough fodder for them and whatever. Well, um, I don't know, do you understand the. Well, I think so. It's a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue, but the, the thing is, um, first of all, we breed them, it's not as though they're just hanging around. But then there, there are a large amount that are now existing. And if, if you're saying, if essentially, if we, if we don't eat them, what do we do? Yeah, no, if we just open the gates and let all the cattle go yeah. into the forests, what little there is left in Ireland. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think many people would, would, would actually put forward that scenario in, in the sense that the ones that, that exist now, because they're domesticated, that there is an argument about which types could, as it were, be let out into the wild. If there's any parts of Ireland that could be described as wild, and well, we'd probably have to import them from Scotland or somewhere. Well, well, it's it's not, it's not that. It's just a question of would they survive. Mm. So, in some senses, we 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 then would. I mean, say, imagine we've got a vegan society now. We we would then probably have a big push to um, our moral obligation would be to care for them while they lived. Okay. Um, but we wouldn't breed anymore to follow them and so therefore they would kind of phase out and um, you know some people said well you know out in a generation the, the issue about that would be do you then interfere with their reproduction in other words would you stop them themselves having babies right if you decided against doing that then you would have a situation where they would become a self-sustaining population if we imagine that they they can actually live out there rather than under our care. What tends to happen though, if you've got a population uh, who are not controlled by predators, then they are controlled by the amount of food supply, as you were saying. And so yeah, they would starve. But that but that's the way that's the way those kind of things work. The the real problem with this scenario is the fact that we've created a really artificial and large population and essentially, kind of vegans, in this kind of you know weird scenario in a way, I, I kind of got the job of, of trying to clear up the mess caused by the, the meat industry. You know how how do you kind of you know wind down from that? But essentially, most arguments is that it wouldn't be that you would just let them go, but what you would do is is you wouldn't breed anymore, and you'd also and this is the contentious part of it you'd also not let them breed as well. And so therefore, the population would be drastically reduced, if not eliminated. And I know, it's, it's interesting that, because I know that that's one part of animal rights theory that people have difficulty getting their head around, because they, they kind of say, I thought you liked animals, and because, you know, you, you're, 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 you're going to reduce the number of them? Well, you, you reduce the number of domesticated domesticated animals. In fact, in, in the animal rights theoretical world, the, the veganic world, there wouldn't be domesticated animals, mm. including pets. They'd all be gone. Yeah. But they wouldn't be killed, and they wouldn't be just let go. That, that wouldn't be the, the, way, the way it goes. And so there would be a distinction made between free living beings, and of course, there is a possibility 
that those now kept as pets or kept as potential food animals, they might be viable, if you like, in you know living free. And uh, I did a podcast recently with uh, a guy called Harold Brown, who used to be a beef farmer, beef in the commas, and uh, now a vegan advocate. And uh, he said that he thought some farm animals possibly could survive out there. But it's a very difficult issue because you've got to think about this massive industry that you're trying to get rid of and what do you do with its victims while you do that. You know? uh, and so it, it's a, it is a difficult one. It's a very complicated thing. But most people, most theories say that we would stop breeding them and then so that means the problem wouldn't keep coming. Sorry? We'd end up with disabled animals, mentally disabled animals. Why? Because they can't survive, like the rabbits that were set free, they can't survive in the wild, so they'd but, have to live I, out I their lives. That, that's not, that wouldn't be the scenario. The, the scenario is not to go into the, to the meat factories and just open the gates. I mean, if, if anything, I think what a vegan society would th start thinking about is have the government, through taxes, which would be you know, gladly paid for by the vegan population, they would set up sanctuaries for mm. these beings to That's live out. Been yeah. Sanctuaries mean... Yeah, so they, they live out their animals. natural life, they die of old age, but they wouldn't have, there wouldn't be the problem, wouldn't keep, keep following because they wouldn't be bred. See, we breed these animals by artificial insemination. It's not as though they're a self-sustaining population. We, we do that. That's, you know, yeah, we do what it. I was saying was looking after the bred animals that the instinctual herding instincts and grazing and everything's gone from there. Oh yeah, I think, I think so there'd be a big push, yeah. I think there'd be a big push within the vegan movement to care for those animals, for that generation. Yeah, and as yeah. I said, it, the contentious part of that is you'd stop them breeding. Okay, because again, stay in neutral pets is a contentious issue within animal the rights theory. It's, it's ironic really in a sense because most animal rights advocates accept that almost you know, without much thought really. But by, by interfering with someone else's reproduction capacities, that's, that's potentially a rights violation. Mm -hmm. And if we did it to a human being, we'd say that straight away. Mm -hmm. And yet we all go, well, we've got, we know we've got to stop, stop the cats and dogs breeding. Yeah. Because we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get our heads around a big mess, not of our making. That's the that's the ground of it. That's the basic. I know, but I, that's where I was coming from dealing with mess. Yes, we've got to deal with There's mess. There's a lot but of animals in cages yeah. that haven't got a clue what they actually even are. Yeah, you know? but we, we, so we need, like, but we wouldn't. We wouldn't just open the cages and go chew. We wouldn't do that. Well, you couldn't because they don't die overnight, probably from hypothermia. Right now. No. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the point the point I was making uh, before is that that you know you were saying about the rabbits that they didn't have a clue. Mm. The same tends to happen with minks. When minks are released, most of them just hang around because they don't also have, have a clue. Some of them do go away. A lot of them are shot. Quite a few are killed on the roads. But the majority of the ones that are liberated actually just stay around the farm. You know, and that's the kind of tragedy of it because they also <coughs> have been institutionalized. So again, we're just back to the idea that we've got to deal with problem made by others who wanted to exploit the ones that we now have to care for. But I mean that really is, is the, the very um, issue about, you know, a sanctuary. I mean, you, you do lots of work for sanctuaries, right? I mean, the, the, these, these people just get animals dumped on them all the time. But, I mean, it's not, it's not as though they, they, they had anything to do with, with creating those animals. You know, it's just, it's just that society has done that. And then, and then, for whatever reason, they get bored and they go, oh, I'll give them to the animal people. You know, give them to them. When I was in Liverpool, we used to get, get, get dogs thrown over the wall into, into, our, into our compound. We used to get cats left on the door loads and loads of times because we were the animal people. You know, got bored of, got bored of my pets, you know, give them to the animal people. You know? So we, we end up trying to um, work out what to do. And there's a big part of what the RSPCA and the ISPCA do which is exactly that. They're trying to mop up a big puddle, not of their making. So that's part of the problem. But it's not a question of just letting them off. No, I understand.
also might be able to tap in more big uh, anyway as a cloud sort of process. Yeah, it should be incremental. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I mean, really, if you if you see that problem as a supply and demand problem, then the demand will lessen, and then the supply will lessen, and so the farmers will breed less and less and less since, until there's hardly any, and so you would get, a, you know, and so in that sense, our problem wouldn't be as big. It's, it's, a, it's a question of whether you'd ever get to a situation because there, there, would, there would be a time when go back to the numbers game because one thing about the numbers is that we don't know how what size of population you need to be where you can make real big change. Some people say you just need something like 10%. So if you had a 10% vegan population, we could then make some real big political and social change. Yeah? Because you'd have 10% of the population actively working for one goal. Which, which is quite a lot for people, because most people don't work for anything apart from themselves. So the collective thing is, is the important thing. You know, if, if we could do that, then we would really reduce uh, you know, the situation. And then there's going to be some people, I used to call them those meat eaters, there's going to be some people who are always going to go, I'll never give up my burgers and I'll never do that. And they, they're the ones who are going to have to be forced one way or another. They'll have to be forced by the Come law, <laughs> or they'll have to be forced through direct action, or you'll just have to be forced by social norms. Or they yeah. just have to become better informed. That was one of the points I wanted to make. It's actually, there's direct action from the education. Yeah, there's a lot of information. Of information is what it's about. There's a vast population that's completely ignorant to the substance of that film. You know, the fact that the images that you see. So, I mean, you only have to show the crew upstairs that film that's going to change their point of view on how they eat meat and how they just whatever they do it without resorting to direct action. It's interesting though because you see, it, 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 it's interesting because there are some animal advocates who try and work out why you can show a film like this or Earthlings or, you know, I mean, there's, there's some films much more graphic than this, like Earthlings. And some people try and work out the, the other side of that coin, how can you show them that film and it doesn't seem to have any effect on them, you know? Uh, or it might seem to have an effect immediately, and then two weeks later they're back in McDonald's, right? Now, that is because they're deeply embedded into something that Tina was talking about, the cultural speciesism. You know, the fine behavior thing. Yeah, but they, you know, it's a, again, it's a safety in numbers thing in the end, because if your culture is telling you it's okay, there are, there are a lot of people who feel uneasy about what they do, but they carry on doing it. Yeah. And I think there would be a lot of people who would just, in fact, over the years, many people have said this to me, that you know, if it was easy for me to be vegan than it is to be admitted, then I would be. In other words, if I went, you know, every time I went into a restaurant, it's all vegan, I'd be, it'd be grand as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because they, 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 you know, they're just the normal kind of people, and sociologically, normal people are conformists. Most people conform. <coughs> to the norms and values of society. If we had vegan norms and values, they would be vegan, apart from a few militants. And the, so the, the militants in, in that society, we would be on their back, because we wouldn't like them, because they, they, they would be the militant meat eaters. So we'd have to put them in jail. And they'd be pushing for an evolution of meat eaters. Yes, indeed. <laughs> OK. Right. Well, thanks very much for your questions. And uh, I'll see you again sometime, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.